Welcome back to season two of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. I'm Marilyn of Midwest Covencast. Here in the second half of season two, we will be making our way through book three of Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy or Magic, which explores ceremonial magic. You can find podcast extras for this season and more at MidwestCovenCast.com. I hope you enjoy this week's installment. Chapter 50 of Rapture and Ecstasy and Soothsayings, which happen to them which are taken with the falling sickness, or with a swoon, or to them in an agony. A rapture is an abstraction and alienation, and an illustration of the soul proceeding from God, by which God doth again retract the soul, being falled from above to hell, from hell to heaven. The cause of this is in us a continual contemplation of sublime things, which as far as it conjoins with a most profound intention of the mind, the soul to incorporeal wisdom doth so far recall itself with its vehement agitations from things sensible and the body, and, as Plato said, in such a manner sometimes that it even flees out of the body and seems, as it were, dissolved even as Aurelius Augustine reports concerning a priest of Calamia, or whom we have made mention before, he lay, said he, most like unto a dead man, without breath, and when he was burnt with fire and wounded, he felt it not. So great, therefore, is the command of the soul, viz., when it hath obtained its own nature, and it is not oppressed by the allurements of the senses, that by its own power it suddenly ascends, not only remaining in the body, but even sometimes loosed from its fetters, and flies forth from the body to the super-celestial habitations, where now, it being most nigh, and most like to God, and made the receptacle of divine things, it is filled with the divine light and oracles. Whence the roaster said, Thou must ascend to the light itself, and to the beams of the Father, whence thy soul was sent thee, clothed with very much mind, and Trismegistus said, it is necessary that thou ascend above the heavens, and be far from the choir of spirits. And Pythagoras said, If thou, by leaving the body, shall pass into the spacious heavens, thou shalt be an immortal god. So we read that Hermes, Socrates, Xenocrates, Plato, Plotinus, Heraclitus, Pythagoras, and Zoroaster were wont to abstract themselves by rapture, and so to learn the knowledge of many things. Also, we read in Herodotus that there was in Proconesus a philosopher of wonderful knowledge called Atheus, whose soul sometimes went out of the body, and after the visitation of places far remote, returned again into the body more learned. Pliny reports the same thing, that the soul of Harmon Clazomenius was wont to wander abroad, his body being left, and to bring true tidings of things very far off. And there are, even to this day, in Norway and Lapland, very many who can abstract themselves three whole days from their body, and being returned declare many things which are afar off. And in the meantime it is necessary to keep them, that not any living creature come upon them or touch them, otherwise they report that they cannot return into their body. Therefore we must know that, according to the doctrine of the Egyptians, seeing the soul is a certain spiritual light, when it is loosed from the body, it comprehends every place and time in such a manner as a light enclosed in a lantern, which being open diffuses itself everywhere and fails not anywhere, for it is everywhere and continually. And Cicero in the book of divination said, neither doth the soul of man at any time divine, except when it is so loosed that it hath indeed little or nothing to do with the body. When, therefore, it shall attain to the state, which is the supreme degree of contemplative perfection, then it is wrapped from all created species, and understands not by acquired species, but by the inspection of the ideas, and it knows all things by the light of the ideas, of which light, Plato said, few men are partakers in this life. But in the hands of the gods, all, also they who are troubled with the syncope and falling sickness, do in some manner imitate a rapture, and in these sicknesses, sometimes, as in a rapture, do bring forth prophecy, 
in which kind of prophesying we read that Hercules and many Arabians were very excellent, and there are certain kinds of soothsayings which are a middle between the confines of natural predictions and supernatural oracles, viz., which declare things to come from some excess of passion as too much love, sorrow, or amongst frequent sights, or in the agony of death, as in Stadius of the mother of Achilles, nor she without parents dear under the glassy gulf the oars did fear, for there in our minds a certain perspicuous power, and capable of all things, but encumbered and hindered by the darkness of the body and mortality, but after death, it having acquired immortality, and being freed from the body, it hath full and perfect knowledge. Hence it cometh to pass, that they who are nigh to death and weakened by old age have sometimes somewhat of an unaccustomed light, because the soul, being less hindered by the senses, understands very acutely, and being now, as it were, a little relaxed from its bands, is not altogether subject to the body, and being, as it were, near the place to the which it is about to go, it easily perceives revelations, which, being mixed with its agonies, are then offered to it. Whence Ambrose, in his book of the belief of the resurrection, said, Which, being free in the aerial motion, knows not whither it goes, and whence it cometh. Yet we know that it survives the body, and that it being freed, the chains of its senses being cast off, freely discerns those things which it saw not before, being in the body, which we may estimate by the example of those who sleep, whose mind being quiet, their bodies being as it were buried, do elevate themselves to higher things, and do declare to the body the visions of things absent, yea, even of celestial things. Chapter 51 of Prophetical Dreams Now I call that a dream which proceeds either from the spirit of the fantasy and intellect united together, or by the illustration of the agent intellect above our souls, or by the true revelation of some divine power in a quiet and purified mind. For by this our soul receives true oracles, and abundantly yields prophecies to us. For in dreams we seem both to ask questions, and learn to read and find them out. Also many doubtful things, many policies, many things unknown and unwished for, nor ever attempted by our minds are manifested to us in dreams. Also the representations of unknown places appear, and the images of men both alive and dead, and of things to come are foretold and also things which at any times have happened are revealed, which we knew not by any report, and these dreams need not any art of interpretation, as those of which we have spoken in the first book, which belong to divination, not foreknowledge. And it cometh to pass that they who see these dreams for the most part understand them not. For, as Abdallah the Arabian said, as to see dreams is from the strength of imagination, so to understand them is from the strength of understanding, whose intellect, therefore, being overwhelmed by the too much commerce of the flesh, is in dead sleep, or its imaginative or fantastic spirit is too dull and unpolished, that it cannot receive the species and representations which flow from the superior intellect, and retain them when received. This man is altogether unfit for the soothsaying by dreams. Therefore, it is necessary that he who would receive true dreams should keep a pure, undisturbed, and undisquieted imaginative spirit, and so compose it, that it may be made worthy of the knowledge and government by the mind and understanding. For such a spirit is most fit for prophesying, and as Synesius said, is a most clear glass of all the images which flow everywhere from all things. When, therefore, we are sound in body, not disturbed in mind, not dulled by meat or drink, nor sad through poverty, nor provoked by any vice or lust or wrath, but chastely going to bed, fall asleep, then our pure and divine soul, being loosed from all hurtful thoughts, and now freed by dreaming, is endowed with the divine spirit as an instrument, and doth receive those beams and representations which are darted down, and shine forth from the divine mind into self. And as it were, in a deifying glass, it doth far more certainly clearly and efficaciously behold all things, when by the vulgar inquiry of the intellect, and by the discourse of reason, the divine power instructing the soul, being invited to their society by the opportunity of the nocturnal solitariness, neither further will that deity be wanting to him when he is awaked, 
which rules all his actions, whosoever therefore doth by quiet and religious meditation, and by a diet temperate, and moderated according to nature, preserve his spirit pure, doth very much prepare himself, that by his means he may become divine, and knowing all things. But whosoever, on the contrary, doth languish with a fantastic spirit, receives not perspicuous and distinct visions. But even as the divine sight, by reason of its weakness, judges confusedly and indistinctly, and also, when we are overcome with wine and drunkenness, then our spirit being oppressed with noxious vapors, as a troubled water is wont to appear in diverse forms, is deceived, and waxes dull, for which case Amphiaris the prophet, as we read in Philostratus, commanded those who would receive oracles to abstain one whole day from meat and three days from wine, that the soul could not rightly prophesy unless it were free from wine and meat. For to sober and religious minds, attending to the divine worship, the gods are wont to give oracles, whence Orpheus cries out, Thou spirit great of prophecy, dost go to souls that sleep fill quietly, and them inspire with knowledge of the gods, and make them soothsay. Hence it was a custom amongst the ancients that they who should receive answers, certain sacred expiations and sacrifices being first celebrated and divine worship ended, did religiously lie down even in a consecrated chamber, or at least on the skins of the sacrifices of which ceremony Virgil makes mention in these verses. Hence they sought answers to doubts when gifts the priests had brought, here we reposed on skins of slaughtered sheep, and under silent night prepares to sleep. And a little after he sings. But now hear King Latinus' oracles to know. They did a hundred choice sheep sacrifice, and on their skins and spreading fleeces lies. And the rulers of the Lacedaemonians, as Cicero said, were wont to lay down in the temple at Pasiphae, and they might dream. The same was done in the temple of Aesculapius from whom true dreams were thought to be sent forth, and the Calabrians, consulting Podolyrus, the son of Asclepius, did sleep near his sepulchre in lambskins. For so doing they were told in their dreams whatsoever they desired to know, for the most usual time for dreams is the night, when the senses are freed from wandering objects and meridian errors and vain affectations." Neither doth fear strike the mind, nor the thought tremble, and the mind being most quiet, doth steadfastly adhere to the deity. For there are, as Rabbi Johannan in his book of senators said, four kinds of true dreams. The first, matutine, which is made between sleep and awakening. The second, which one sees concerning another. The third, whose interpretation is shown in the same dreamer in the nocturnal vision. The fourth, which is repeated to the same dreamer according to that which Joseph said to Pharaoh. But that thou hast seen the dream belonging to the same thing the second time, it is a sign of confirmation. But that dream is most sure, which is concerning those things which one did meditate on and revolve in his mind when he goes to bed. As it is written, Thou, O king, didst think upon thy bed, what should become of these things? But it is necessary that he which interprets other men's dreams hath the knowledge by the which he can distinguish and discern the similitudes of all things and know the customs of all nations, according to the laws which they have received from God and his angels. Farther this must be known, that there is scarce any dream without some vanity, as no grain of corn without his chaff, which thing even the dream of Joseph the patriarch manifests which his father Jacob interpreted, saying, What means this dream that thou hast seen? What shall I and thy mother and thy brethren fall down and worship thee? Which effect concerning his mother, who shortly after died, followed not? Also Rabbi Johanan, in the foresighted book, said these things, and also Rabbi Levi affirms that no prophetical dream can be kept back from his effect longer than twenty-two years. So Joseph dreamed in the seventeenth year of his age, which was accomplished in the thirty-ninth year of his age. Therefore, whosoever would receive divine dreams, let him be well disposed in body, his brain free from vapors, and his mind from perturbations, and let him that day abstain from supper. Neither let him drink that which will inebriate." 
let him have a clean and neat chamber, also exercised and consecrated, in the which a perfume being made, his temples anointed, things causing dreams being put on his fingers, and the representation of the heavens being put under his head, and paper being consecrated, his prayers being said, let him go to bed, earnestly meditating on that thing he desires to know, so he shall see most true in certain dreams, with the true illumination of his intellect." Whosoever, therefore, shall know to join together those things which here and there we have delivered concerning this matter in these books, he shall easily obtain the gift of oracles and dreams. Chapter 52 of Lots and Marks Possessing the Sure Power of Oracles There are also certain lots having a divine power of oracles, and as it were indexes of divine judgment, being before sought for by earnest prayer, and sometimes commanded by God himself to be done, as is read in Leviticus, concerning a goat to be offered to the Lord, and of the scapegoat, and in the book of Numbers, of the rods of the tribes of Israel. Now both Moses and Joshua did by lots in the presence of the Lord divide the lands and inheritances to the tribes of Israel according to the command of God. The apostles of Christ, prayers going before, did by lot choose Matthias into the place of Judas the traitor. Jonas the prophet, when he flying from the presence of God, did sail to Tharsis, a dangerous storm being raised, was by lot found out by the mariners to be the cause of the danger, and being cast into the sea, the tempest ceased. Caesar reports of M. Valerius Proculus being taken by his enemies, concerning whom it was consulted whether he should be presently burnt or reserved to another time, that by lot he escaped safe. There was formerly at Bura a town of Achia, an oracle of Hercules, constituted by a chessboard, where he that went to consult of anything, after he had prayed, cast four dice, the cast of which the prophet observing did find written in the chessboard what should come to pass. Now all such dice were made of the bones of sacrifices. Now this you must know that the ancients were not wont upon every slight cause to cast lots, but either upon necessity or for some advantageous end, and that not but with great devotion, reverence, expiations, fasting, purity, prayers, invocation, vows, sacrifices, consecrations, and such like sacred mysteries of religion. For these sacred ordinances were wont to go before our works, especially to procure the divine good will and pleasure and the presence of the divine spirits, by whose dispensation, the lot being directed, we may receive a true judgment of the things sought for. Everyone, therefore, that works by lots must go about it with a mind well disposed, not troubled nor distracted, and with a strong desire, firm deliberation, and constant intention of knowing that which shall be desired. Moreover, he must, being qualified with purity, chastity, and holiness towards God and the celestials, with an undoubted hope, firm faith, and sacred orations, invocate them that he may be made worthy of receiving the divine spirits and knowing the divine pleasure. For if thou shalt be qualified, they will discover to thee most great secrets by virtue of lots, and thou shalt become a true prophet and able to speak truth concerning things past, present, and to come, of which thou shalt be demanded. Now, what we have spoken here concerning lots is also to be observed in the auguries of all discerning, viz., when with fear, yet with a firm expectation, we prefix to our souls, for the sake of prophesying, some certain works, or require a sign, as Eleazar, Abraham's countryman, and Gideon, judge in Israel, are read to have done. There was once at Pharis, a city of Achaia, in the middle of the market, a statue of Mercury, where he that went to receive any omen, did frankincense, being fumed, and candles being lighted, which were set before it, and that country coin being offered on the right hand of the statue, whisper into the right ear of the statue whatsoever he would demand, and presently his ears being stopped with both his hands, did make haste away from the marketplace, which when he was passed, did presently, his ears being opened, observe the first voice he did hear from any man or a certain oracle given to him. Although, therefore, these kinds of lots seem to the ignorant to be casual or fortuitous, and to have nothing of reason in them, 
yet they are disposed by God and the higher virtues of certain reasons. Neither they do fall beside the intention of him that moderates them. Was not the lot in choosing Saul to be king of Israel thought to fall upon him casually and fortuitously? Yet he was before appointed by the Lord to be king and anointed by the prophet Samuel and God that appointed him king disposed of the lot that it should fall upon him and thus much of these. Chapter 53 how he that will receive oracles must dispose himself. Whosoever, therefore, being desirous to come to the supreme state of the soul, goes to receive oracles, must go to them being chastely and devoutly disposed, being pure and clean. Go to them so that his soul be polluted with no filthiness and free from all guilt. He must also so purify his mind and body as much as he may from all diseases and passions and all irrational conditions which adhere to it as rust to iron. By rightly composing and disposing those things which belong to the tranquility of the mind, for by this means he shall receive the truer and more efficacious oracles. Now by what things the mind is purged and reduced into a divine purity, we must learn by religion and wisdom. For neither wisdom without religion, nor religion without wisdom, is to be approved of. For wisdom, as said Solomon, is the tree of life to them that lay hold on it. And Lucretius said that it is the intention of God, or the breathings of God, where he sings. Most famous Memmius, this that God is he the prince of life, who reason which all we call wisdom first found out, and who by art the life from trouble's darkness set apart, and freed and unto light, and peace reduced. He also understands that to be a divine illustration, whence Democritus thinks that there were no men wise, but they that are struck with some divine frenzy, as was Menos, that Cretensian, whom they reported learned all things of Jupiter, whence he had frequent converse with God in the Mount Ida. So also the Athenians report that Melisagora Eleusinus was taught by the nymphs. So also we read that Hesiod, when he was a shepherd in Boeotia and kept his flock near the mountain Helicon, had some pens given him by the muses, which having received, he presently became a poet, which to become so suddenly was not of man, but by a divine inspiration. For God, conveying himself into holy souls, makes men prophets and workers of miracles, being powerful in work and speech, as Plato and Mercurius affirm, and also Zeistus, the Pythagoreans, saying that such a man is the temple of God, and that God is his guest, to whom ascends our Paul, calling man the temple of God, and in another place, speaking of himself, I can do all things in him that strengthens me, for he is our power, without which, as he said, we can do nothing, which also Aristotle confesses in his meteors and ethics, saying that there is no virtue, whether natural or moral, but by God. And in his secrets, he said that a good and sound intellect can do nothing in the secrets of nature without the influence of divine virtue. Now we receive this influence then only, when we do acquit ourselves from burdensome impediments and form carnal and terrene occupations, and from all external agitation, neither can a blear or impure eye behold things too light, neither can he receive divine things who is ignorant of the purifying of his mind. Now we must come to this purity of mind by degrees. Neither can any one that is initiated newly unto those mysteries presently comprehend all clear things, but his mind must be accustomed by degrees until the intellect becomes more enlightened and applying itself to the divine light be mixed with it. A human soul, therefore, when it shall be rightly purged and expiated, doth then, being loosed from all impurity, break forth with a liberal motion, and ascends upwards, receives divine things, instructs itself, when haply it seems to be instructed from elsewhere. Neither doth it then need any remembrance or demonstration by reason of the industry of itself, as by its mind, which is the head and the pilot of the soul." It doth, imitating by its own nature and angels, attain to what it desires, not by succession or time, but in a moment. For David, when he had not learning, was of a shepherd, made a prophet, and most expert of divine things. Solomon, in the dream of one night, was filled with the knowledge of all things above and below. 
So Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and other prophets and apostles were taught. For the soul, which is the common opinion of the Pythagoreans and Platonists, can by way of purification, without any other study or searching, only by an easy and adventitious collating on these intelligible received from above, acquire the perfect knowledge of all things knowable. It can also be an extrinsically expiation attained to this, as to understand all things invisible by its substantial form. For the mind is purged and expiated by cleansing, by abstinence, by penitency, by alms, and then also do thereunto conduce certain sacred institutions, as shall afterward be discovered. For the soul is to be cured by the study of religions, and indeed these which are commonly called occult, that being restored to its soundness, confirmed by truth, and fortified by divine graces, may not fear any rising shakings." Chapter 54 of Cleanness and How to Be Observed. We must, therefore, first observe cleanness in food, in works, in affections, and to put away all filthiness and perturbations of the mind, and whatsoever sense or spirit that offends, and whatsoever things are in mind unlike to the heavens, not only if they be in mind and spirit, but also if they be in the body or about the body. For such an external cleanness is believed not to help a little to the purity of the mind. For this cause, the Pythagorean philosophers, being taken with the desire of oracles, divine praises being celebrated, did wash themselves in a river as in a bath, and did put on a white raiment and linen. For they did account wool a profane clothing, being the excrements of beasts, and they did inhabit in a pure chamber and altogether unspotted. In like manner, the Brahmins, the wise men of the Indians, were wont to wash themselves naked in a fountain, which is called Dirs in Boeotia, their heads being first anointed with amber drops, and odors fit for that purpose. Then after they were, according to custom, sufficiently clean, they were to go forth about noon, clothed in white linen, with a white attire, having rings on their fingers and staves in their hands. In like manner, amongst the gymnosophists, it was a custom to wash themselves thrice in a day, and twice in the night, in cold water, before they entered into the holy places. They did also, every day, use linen garments, every day newly washed. We read also of the manner of this kind of washing in Hesiod, in his books of works and days, where he sings, None dare with hands unwashed unto Jove, wine pour forth, nor unto the gods above. For then they do refuse for to be heard, though being prayed unto. And elsewhere, when wicked men, the rivers do pass by, with hands unwashed, then are the gods angry with them, and them afflict. Hence in Virgil, Aeneas thus speaks to his father, O father, take the household gods, and hold them in thy sacred hands, and be so bold as them to handle after so great fights. I dare not till that washed in streams most bright. It was also a custom amongst the Gentiles, when they were wont to perform any holy services to the gods, to cleanse their bodies by washing, and when they were to contend with the infernal gods, sprinkling only did suffice. Hence, in Virgil Dido, when she did perform any solemnities to the gods, said, Cause that my sister Anne, my nurse most dear, come and my body wash with water clear. And in another place where Aeneas is brought in amongst the infernal, bringing a bow to Prosperina, he sings thus, The passage doth Aeneas keep and wash his body with fresh water. Also when he relates of Mecenas, to be buried, he sings, His friends he thrice did wash with water new, and with an olive branch wet in the dew he did them sprinkle. Now man, being made thus clean, becomes celestial and spiritual, and is fitted for the sight of the union with God whilst he ministers to God with a clean body and pure mind, and delights in the cleanness of all things, as inwards, skin, garments, houses, utensils, oblations, gifts, and sacrifices, the cleanness of all, which even purifies the air and attracts the most pure influence of celestial and divine things, and allures the pure ministers of God and good demons, although sometimes impure spirits and ill demons, as the apes of the good demons, take upon them this kind of cleanness, 
that either they may be adored or may deceive. Therefore, first of all, we must observe that the mind be pure and the heart pure, and then the impure powers cannot ascend. Chapter 55 of Abstinence, Fastings, Chastity, Solitariness, Tranquility, and Ascent of the Mind. Abstinence also doth commonly fortify and defend the observers thereof against vices and evil demons, and makes the mind an unpolluted temple of God, uniting it to God. For nothing doth more conduce to health and temperance of the complexion than not to heap together superfluities, and not to exceed the bounds of necessary food. Neither is nutriment to be taken that is too strong for nature, but rather let nature be stronger than the meat." as some affirm of Christ, that he took meat in that proportion that it should not breed any excrement of the third concoction. Many others, also taking meat sparingly, enjoyed thereby health and agility of body, as Moses and Elias, who fasted forty days, whence his face shined and he lifted up, could easily guide his body as if it were a spirit. For magicians and philosophers affirm that our spirit is not a terrain thing, or body nourished by nutriment, received through certain organs, by the concoction of meat and drink, but draws in their ailment like sponges through the whole body, viz. from the thin vapors penetrating the body on all sides. Therefore, they that desire to have the spirit pure and potent, let him use drier meats, and extenuate this gross body with fasting, and they make it easily penetrable, and least by the weight thereof, the spirit should either become thick or be suffocated. Let them preserve the body clean by lotions, frictions, exercises, and clothings, and corroborate their spints by lights and fumes, and bring it to a pure and thin finesse. We must, therefore, in taking of meats, be pure and abstinent." as the Pythagorean philosophers, who keeping a holy and sober table, did protract their life and all temperance. The temperance, therefore, of life and complexion, because thereby no superfluous humor is bred, which may dull the fantasy, makes that our soul oftentimes dreaming and sometimes watching, is always subjected to the superior influences." Moreover, the Pythagoreans, if any one doth by abstinence moderate prudently every motion of the mind and body, promise perpetual health of both and long life. So the Brahmins did admit none to their college but those that were abstinent from wine, from flesh, and vices, saying that none could understand God, but they that emulate him by a divine conversation which also Freodes in Philostratus taught the lower Indians. Moreover, we must obtain from all those things which infect either the mind or spirit, as from covetousness and envy, which are handmaids to injustice, as Hermes said, enforcing the mind and the body to evil practices, also from idleness and luxury, for the soul being suffocated with the body and lust cannot foresee any celestial thing. Wherefore the priests of the Athenians, who are called in Greek Hierophante, as Hiram reports, that they might live more chastely in their sacred employments, and might follow their divine affairs without lust, were wont to castrate themselves by drinking of hemlock. Moreover, the chastity of a mind devoted to God doth make our mind, as Orpheus teaches Musius in the hymn of all the gods, a perpetual temple of God. Also, we must abstain from all multitude and variety of senses, affections, imaginations, opinions, and such like passions, which hurt the mind and pervert the judgment of reason, as we manifestly see in the lascivious and envious and ambitious. Wherefore, Cicero, in his Tusculan's questions, calls these passions the sicknesses of the mind, and the pestiferous diseases thereof. But Horace calls them furies, or madness, where he sings, Girls have a thousand furies, so have boys. The same also seems to be of opinion that all men are fools in something. Whence is read in Ecclesiasticus, there are an infinite number of fools, Therefore the Stoics deny that passions are incident to a wise man. 
I say such passions which follow the sensitive apprehension, for rational and mental passions they yield a wise man may have. This opinion did Boetus seem to be of, where he sings that some passions are to be laid aside in the inquisition of truth in these verses. If truth thou wouldst discover with clear sight, and walk in the right path, then from thee quit. Joy, fear, grief, hope expel, for where these reign, the mind is dark and bound. We must therefore quit and avert our minds from all multitudes, and such like passions, that we may attain to the simple truth, which indeed many philosophers are said to have attained to in the solitude of a long time. For the mind, by solitude being loosed from all care of human affairs, is at leisure and prepared to receive the gifts of the celestial deities. So Moses, the lawgiver to the Hebrews, and the greatest of prophets, and learned in all the knowledge of the Chaldeans and Egyptians, when he would abstract himself from senses, sent into the vast wilderness, of Ethiopia, where all human affairs being laid aside, he applied his mind to the sole contemplation of divine things, in which thing he so pleased the omnipotent God that he suffered him to see him face to face, and also gave him a wondrous power of miracles, as sacred writ testifies of him. So Zoroaster, the father and prince of the magicians, is said to attain to the knowledge of all natural and divine things by the solitude of twenty years." when he wrote and did very strange things concerning all the art of divining and soothsaying. The like things do the writings of Orpheus to Musaeus declare him to have done in the deserts of Thracia. So we read that Epimenides of Crete because learned by a very long sleep, for they say that he slept fifty years, i.e. to have lay hid so long Pythagoras also in like manner, to have lain hid ten years, and Heraclitus and Democritus, for the same cause were delighted with solitariness. For by how much the more we have relinquished the animal and the human life, by so much the more we live like angels and gods, to which being conjoined and brought into a better condition, we have power over all things, ruling over all. Now how our mind is to be separated from an animal life and from all multitude, and to be erected until it ascend to that very one, good, true, and perfect, through each degree of things knowable and knowledges. Proclus teaches in his commentaries upon Alcibiades, showing how that first sensible things are to be shunned, that we may pass to an incorporeal essence, where we must exceed the order of souls, yet multiplied by diverse rules, habitudes, and various proportions, many bonds, and a manifold variety of forces, and to strive after an intellect, an intelligible kingdom, to contemplate how far better these are than souls. Moreover, we must bear an intellectual multitude, although united and individual, and come to the superintellectual and essential unity, absolute from all multitude, and the very fountain of good and truth. In like manner, we must avoid all knowledge that doth any ways distract and deceive, that we may obtain the most simple truth. The multitude, therefore, of affections, senses, imaginations, and opinions is to be left, which in itself is as different as some things are contrary to others in any subject. And we must ascend to sciences, in which although there be a various multitude, yet there is no contrariety. For all are knit one to the other, and do serve one to the other, under one the other, until they come to one, presupposed by all, and supposing none, beyond it to which all the rest may be referred, Yet this is not the highest top of knowledges, but above it is a pure intellect. Therefore, all composition, division, and various discourse being laid aside, let us, ascending to the intellectual life and simple sight, behold the intelligible essence with individual and simple precepts, that we may attain to the highest being of the soul, by which we are one, and under which our multitude is united. Therefore, let us attain to the first unity, from whom there is a union in all things, through that one which is the flower of our essence, which then at length we attain to, when avoiding all multitude, we do arise into our very unity, are made one, and act uniformly. Chapter 56 Of Penitency and Alms 
Now, the greatest part of purgations is a voluntary penitence for faults, for, as said Seneca in Thyeste, he whom it grieves that he hath offended is in manner innocent. This brings to us the greatest expiation, whilst it opposes afflictings to delights and purges out of the soul a stupid joyfulness and gives a certain peculiar power, reducing us to the things above. Penitence, therefore, is not only a mortification of vices, but a spiritual martyrdom of the soul, which with the sword of the spirit is on all sides mortified. Now, the sword of the spirit is the word of God. Whence Jeremiah the prophet said, and also Paul, writing to the Ephesians, Cursed is he that withholds his sword from blood. And the psalmist sings, A sword is in their lips. Therefore our cogitations, affections of our mind, and all evils that proceed from our heart and mouth, must be uttered to the priest in confession, that he may, according to the word of God, judge those things, and according to the power granted to him by God, penitence being joined with it, may purify and purge them, and direct them to that which is good." Neither is there found in religion, for the expiating heinous offenses, a stronger sacrament. Hence the gods themselves, Ovid and Pontus being witness, do often cease the pains, restore the lights, which were caught away when that mortal waits, they see repenting of their sins. There is as yet another sacrament of expiation, viz. almsgiving, of which, as I remember, I have read very little in philosophers, but the very truth taught us that saying, Give ye alms, and all things shall be clean to you. And in Ecclesiasticus, it is read, As water extinguishes fire, so alms doth sin. And Daniel taught the king of Babylon that he should redeem his sins by alms. And the angel Raphael testifies to Tobias, because alms frees from death, and is that which purges sin and makes us find eternal life. Hence Christ commanded us to pray to the Father, Forgive as we forgive others, give us as we give to others. Of which he said in another place, Ye shall receive an hundredfold, and shall possess eternal life. He shall, when he comes to judge the quick and the deed, upbraid the wicked above all things, for their neglect of alms and works of mercy." when he shall say, I was hungry and thirsty, and ye gave me neither meat nor drink. And in another place he speaks of the poor. What ye have done to any one of them, ye have done to me. Which Homer also seems to be sensible of, when he brings in a young man wooing Antinoe, saying these words, Antinoe, now plausibly, hast thou slain a poor beggar, he shall destroy thee if God be in heaven, for the gods themselves, being likened to strangers and guests, go out into the whole world, overturning cities, and beholding the injuries and wickedness of men. Chapter 57 Of those things which being outwardly administered conduce to expiation. It is believed, and it is delivered by them that are skillful in sacred things, that the mind also may be expiated with certain institutions and sacraments, ministered outwardly, as by sacrifices, baptisms, and adorations, benedictions, consecrations, sprinklings of holy water, by anointing, and fumes, not so much consecrated to this as having a natural power thus to do. Upon this account, sulfur hath a place in religions to expiate ill demons with the fume thereof. An egg also was wont to be used in purgations. Hence eggs are called holy, whence Ovid. Let the old woman come and purge the bed and place and bring sulfur and eggs sacred in her trembling hand. Proclus also writes that the priests, in purifying, were wont to use sulfur and butamen, or the washing of seawater, for sulfur purifies by the sharpness of its odor, and seawater by reason of its fiery part, in like manner the herb syncofoil, wherefore by reasons of its purity in ancient priests did use it in purifications, also the boughs of olives, for these are said to be of so great purity that they report that an olive tree planted by an harlot is thereby forever made unfruitful, or else withers. In like manner, frankincense, myrrh, vervain, valerian, and the herb called foo conduce to expiation. Also, the blessed clove flower, 
and the gall of a black dog being fumed is said to be very powerful in these, as well for expiating of ill spirits as any bewitching. Also, the feathers of a lapwing being fumed drives away phantasms. It is wonderful and scarce credible, but that that gave and worthy author Josephus relates it in his history of Jerusalem, of a root of Baras, so called from a place near Macernus, a town of Judea, being of a yellow color, that in the night it did shine, and was hard to be taken, that it did oftentimes deceive the hands of them that went to take it, and go out of their sight, never stood still, till the urine of a menstruous woman was sprinkled on it. Neither yet, being thus retained, is it pulled up without danger, but sudden death falls upon him that draws it up, unless he were fortified with an amulet of the said root, which they that want, sacrificing about the earth to do bind the root to a dog by a cord, and presently depart. At length the dog, with a great deal of pains, draws up the root, and as it were supplying the place of his master presently dies, after which any one may handle the root without danger, the power of which is much excellent in expiations, as is manifest for the delivery of those that are vexed with unclean spirits. Now that these kinds of matters should act upon spiritual substances by putting them to flight, or by alluring them, or mitigating them, or by inciting them, they are of no other opinion than the fire of Cecilia acts upon souls, which William of Paris being witness, not hurting the bodies, doth mostly intolerably torment the souls of them that are near, but of those in part we have treated before. Chapter 58 of Adorations and Vows Adorations and vows, sacrifices and oblations, are certain degrees in sacred things to find out God and those things which principally provoke the divine pleasure and procure a sacred and indissolvable communion of God with souls. For by prayers, which we utter with true and sacred words, sensibly and affectionately, we obtain a great power, when by the application of them to any deity we do so far move it, that he may direct his speech and answer by a divine way." by which, as said Dionysus, God speaks with men, but so occultly that very few perceive it. But oftentimes that king and prophet David perceives it, when he said, I will hear what the Lord will speak in me. Adoration, therefore, being a long time continued and often frequented, perfects the intellect and makes the soul more large for the receiving of divine lights, inflaming divine love, producing faith, hope, and sacred manners, purifies the soul from all contrariety, and what is any way adverse to it, and doth also repel diverse evils, which would otherwise naturally fall out. Hence Ovid sings, With prayers moved as Jove, I oftentimes have seen, when from above, he would see dreadful lightnings, him to be appeased with frankincense. Now man is returned to God by prayers, by which coming he, said Plato in Phaedrus, stops horses and enters into the chambers of repose where he feeds upon ambrosia and drinks nectar therefore they that desire to enjoy any virtue must pray and supplicate often to him who hath all virtue in himself now that is the best prayer which is not uttered in words but that which with a religious silence and sincere cogitation is offered up to god and that which with the voice of the mind and words of the intellectual world is offered to him. Now a vow is as ardent affection of a chaste mind given up to God, which by vowing wishes that which seems good. This affection, as Iamblichus and Proclus testify, doth so join the soul to God, that the operation of the mind and of God is one, viz. of God as an artificer, of the mind as a divine instrument, all antiquity testifies that by vows sometimes miracles are done, diseases are cured, tempests are diverted, and such like. Hence, we read that the most excellent and wise in all nations, the Brahmins of the Indians, the magicians of the Persians, the gymnosophists of the Egyptians, the divines of the Greeks and Chaldeans, which did excel in divine secrets, did apply themselves to divine vows and prayers, and thereby did effect many wonderful things. Now to the perfection of a vow and adoration, for a vow cannot be perfect without an adoration, nor an adoration without a vow, there are two things especially required. 
viz. First, the knowledge of the thing to be adored, and to which we must vow, and in what manner, and order, and by what mediums it must be worshipped. For there are various co-operators and instruments of God, viz. the heavens, stars, administering spirits, the celestial souls, and heroes, which we must implore as porters, interpreters, administrators, mediators. But first of all him who goes to the archetype God, who only is the utmost term of adoration. The other deities are, as it were, passengers to that very God. Know, therefore, that adorations and vows must, with a pure and pious mind, be principally made to that one only God, the highest Father, King, and Lord of all the gods. But when they shall come before to the inferior gods, let the intention of the administration be terminated in them. Therefore, to adorations and vows, when they be directed to the inferior deities, Zoroaster and Orpheus, thought fitting that suffumigations and characters should be used. But when they are erected to the majesty of the supreme God, they must not in any wise, which also Hermes and Plato forbid to be done. Whence Hermes to Tatius, this, said he, is like to sacrilege, when thou prays to God to be willing to kindle frankincense and such like. For, said Porphyry, they are not agreeable to piety. For there is not any material thing can be found, which to the immaterial God is not unclean. Therefore neither is that prayer which is uttered by words agreeable to him, nor that prayer which is mental, if the mind be polluted with vice. Secondly, there is also required a certain assimilation of our life to the divine life in purity, chastity, and holiness, with a lawful desire of that which we wish for. For by this means we especially obtain the divine benevolence, and are subjected to the divine bounty. For unless we, having our minds purged, be worthy to be heard, and also those things which we desire be worthy to be done, it is manifest that the gods will not hearken to our prayers. Whence divine Plato said that God cannot be bound by our prayers or gifts to do unjust things. Therefore, let us desire nothing of God which we think uncomely to wish for. For by this means only, we see that very many are frustrated of their prayers and vows." because that neither they themselves are religiously disposed, nor are their desires and prayers made for those things which are well-pleasing to God. Neither do they know to discern in what order they ought to pray, and through what mediators they ought to go to God, the ignorance of which doth very oft reduce our prayers and supplications to nothing, and causes our desires and wishes to be denied. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Midwest Covencast Presents Weekend Reads. Join us next time as we continue through Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa's Three Books of Occult Philosophy or Magic, Book 3, Ceremonial Magic. To access podcast extras and so much more, you can visit MidwestCovenCast.com. Otherwise, I hope you will visit us on social media at Midwest Covencast on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram, and at Midwest Coven on Twitter. Until next time, Coven, blessed be.